Could you please ask the blessing on the offering this evening? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we are just grateful to be in your house again tonight. Father, just to sing praises to you, to lift up your name above all, Father, that we can just glean from your words, Father. Looking forward to hearing your word being brought tonight, Father, that it can help us and to, uh, to make us into what you want us to be, that your will be done in our lives, Father, that we just bring honor and glory to you in all that we do, that we would, um, we would glean from your words, Father, to that walk with you, that's pleasing with you, Father. Father, I just pray that you will bless the offering you're about to receive, that you would use it to, uh, to magnify your word and truth and spread it to those who are in need. Father, we thank you for it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. <laughs>
If you would, let's all stand together. Turn over one more time to hymn number 34. Hymn number 34. If you guys come, thank you so much again for always making the dedicated effort to be here with us. We just counted a treasure every time that you come in the door. We appreciate that so very much. And so they're going to sing a few for us, and then Brother Dan's going to bring the message here right out. because he's preaching tonight, so if he's not excited, we're in trouble. Um, 
Alright. <coughs> got uh, our mom got to come with us tonight, so that's good. I think uh, George. George from our church there. Snuck in. He already knows what I was thinking about. Right. <laughs> I was thinking about how this meeting always, always gets so much out of it, and, uh, and I'm thankful that the Lord uses it in my life. And, uh, and I know that uh, the church, I always feel like this church responds well, and uh, and the people really have a heart for it, and uh, and you can tell, and you know. I, I, I think a lot of that's due to the, the leadership of, of uh, Brother Jim and Miss Kim there, and uh, I know there's such a blessing here, and I don't, you know, now that uh, we're family, I, I was trying to think if I could say anything bad about them, but <laughs> now that we're family, I can, but I, I there's nothing I really have to say bad at all. They're some of the nicest people I've ever met, honestly. <laughs> Thank you all for your leadership here and now uh, your family ship. Uh, appreciate that. Taking in our, our son and uh, treating, treating him good. So appreciate that. All right. Well, we got to that now. There's no power in the water. There's no power. Born to die. And, uh, 
years ago, and when we sang the song, I actually sang the verses, but uh, Rebecca's doing it now, so uh, it's a great song. He wrote a lot of wrote really good songs, and uh, good doctrinal songs, and it's one that we really like. And so, uh, I'll try to do that. You good over there? Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of it's, uh, hit and miss here, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll make it wow! <laughs>
been doing all the new songs in the, in the hymn book here, so um, I'm not going to be able to play anymore with some of these songs. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> some of these, and this newfangled hymn rule that y'all have now. I like the other one just because I know all the, not the song numbers. Um, they, the kids quiz me a lot on I'll pick a number and, I, and I'll guess the hymn or, or tell me a hymn and I'll guess the number. So and now I don't know that anymore. So. He's really in mourning.
Wonderful. Isn't Jesus wonderful? <laughs> good, good. I loved it. And that's something we were born again to die, aren't we? Uh, we have to die to self. And self dies hard. We call for a revival to deal with ourselves. Amen. Amen. This is not, uh, when the preacher's preaching a message, you shouldn't be thinking, boy, I hope Sister Flapjaw gets it tonight. <laughs> huh? Or that, that Mr. Pride and Arrogance over there. I hope he got that message. He needed it. No, it's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And I like that last song because it's about time we fell on our face. I want to preach this evening on fall on your face before you fall on your face. Okay? Let's take our Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 26. The Bible says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? People started talking to God. You ever talk to God? Amen. I'm working up a message on becoming intimate in prayer. Most people run into the presence of God and they give them their list of what they want and they, before God even finishes hearing them, they're out and gone. And then they're going, where's God? Why didn't he come through for me? And then that's a perfect reason for people to quit living for God. Did you know that there are people today that used to sit in the pew like you do and they used to say amen and they were all excited about the things of God and you can't find them anymore. They went AWOL. They got away from God. It can happen to any of us. Amen. Let him that thinketh, he standeth. Take heed, lest he fall. In the book of Jude, verse 24, if you'd like to run over there with me, Jude, verse 24, that's just before the book of Revelation. I want you to see this verse because I think it's very, very important for us to understand that any one of us can fall. Now watch this. I didn't say lose your salvation. Lose your power with God. And make wrong decisions. Anybody ever make a wrong decision? That's right. Jude verse 24 there. Now unto him that is able to keep you from what? Falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding what? Joy. Those that don't fall into sin can stand before the Lord faultless. Remember Pilate? What did he say about Jesus? I find no fault in him. The centurion that stood there over the, under the cross. What did he say? Truly this was the Son of God. Yeah. In Psalm chapter 18, verse 36, the Bible says, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. How many have ever fallen on ice? Amen. It hurts. Amen. You ever slip? Yeah. As Christians, we slip. Some Christians like to see how close they can get to the world without, without falling off. It 
Some Christians like to be just enough right with God so that nobody's bugging them. Yeah. yeah. Living on the edge is dangerous. You heard the story about the man that wanted to hire someone to, to drive his horses and chariot. And so he brought one guy in and the guy, man, he... He went right down the center of that road. There was a cliff over the edge there, and he stayed right in the middle. So it was just, no one could say he didn't do it any better than that, just perfectly down the middle. Then one guy was a hot shot. He thought, man, I want to show this guy how well I can drive. Boy, he got as close to the edge as he could. He thought, man, that's going to really impress him how well I can do. The third guy that was asked to try out, he got as close to the hill as he could. He didn't go in the middle. He got way over as close to the, to, to, to the, uh, to, to the hill there instead of to the very edge. I wonder who he hired. He hired the one that was closest to the hill. And I'm going to tell you, we don't need to get as close to the edge as we can get. We ought to get as far from the edge as we can get. Amen. Neither give place to the devil. Amen. I would like to take you on a journey in the Bible where people fell on their face. Now, some fall on their face in disgrace. Some fall on their face before God and they stay clean and pure before the Lord and they finish strong. Amen. People fall on their face for a number of reasons. The first reason is they love God. Doesn't it seem like all of us would want to spend time with the Lord? Amen. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'll be praying for a while and all of a sudden I'll sense his presence. You ever have that happen to you? Yeah. I remember when God called me to preach. I told my dad I'll never be a preacher and I'm never going to Bible college. He smiled at me because he knew that God heard me. You better be careful what comes out of your mouth because it comes right from your heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so this youth director asked me if I wanted to go to a big meeting down in Springfield, Missouri, and I thought it was a youth rally, a lot of activity and fun, you know. I got down there and it was a preacher's meeting. I had to sit through 16 sermons. If I had known that, I never would have went. And it cost me $70 to go. But on the 15th sermon, God spoke to me. Has God ever spoken to you? Isn't it awesome? He said, Daniel, you've come to a Y in the road. If you make a left-hand turn, you'll be a New York State police officer, and you will be miserable. If you make a right-hand turn and be a preacher, you will be happy. Can God speak in terms that clear? And I, I, I always wanted to be a state trooper. Drive fast, carry a gun, pull people over, you know. And, um, you know, a preacher sounded pretty boring to me. But after Almighty God spoke to me, out of all the people in this world, he found me and he told me what he wanted from me. Amen. And I got excited about it so much so that I'm into it 45 years now. <laughs> and I have no desire to quit. Amen. So God does talk to us. Remember when you got saved? He was talking to you by his Holy Spirit, convicting you of your sin, convincing you you needed to be saved, and then converting you unto himself. 
But in the Bible, we find cases where people just fell on their face in love for God. Some fell on their face in time of crisis. Boy, that'll get you praying. Amen? How many of you had a crisis in your life or in your family's life or in the church's life and it brought you to your knees? Amen. That means you started picking up more time with God. A crisis will do it. How about when you need to know the will of God for your life? <laughs> There's nobody that gives better advice than God. Amen. You be careful who you get your advice from. I had a guy come to me one time, one of our better men in the church, wanted to know if he could divorce his wife. I said, why do you want to divorce your wife? He said, I can't stand my mother-in-law. <laughs> That's ridiculous. And so he took me out to lunch to tell me that he was, gonna pl he was planning on it. And I said, no, that's ridiculous. And then he didn't, he didn't do. He didn't do what he wanted to do. He did what God wanted him to do. Him and his wife are still together and they're doing great. <laughs> See, a person can fall and still be saved. You know, God has no problem exposing people that have fallen Take Samson, the big tough man, the powerful Nazarite. Yeah. He fell, didn't he? God used him in spite of himself, but, and he got rid of a lot of Philistines, but he failed the Lord. He failed the Lord. I think of David with Bathsheba. What a failure that was. You talk about falling. What a terrible mess that caused. But he knew how to repent. Amen. Amen. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my sin and cleanse me. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me. Powerful. One of the greatest confessions you'll ever hear. Amen. Amen. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived until he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That man went nuts. <laughs> Let's be honest. And the Bible says those wives stole his heart from God. He fell. He fell. Can you, be, can you imagine being the wisest man and becoming the dumbest man? And it can happen just like that. Yeah. Now, let's take a look in the scriptures. Number one, Abram was filled with doubt. In Genesis chapter 17, if you'd like to turn there, I'm going to go fast because I've got a lot of stories to tell. You might want to write down the stories and look, look at it later when you get a chance, but I think every one of us need to, need to read these things and go through them. Genesis 17, Abraham, and Abram fell on his face and God talked with him. The story about that was 24 years earlier, God had told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a child. But God's not in a big hurry like everybody else is, and they got ahead of God, and and Sarah said, take my handmaiden and go in unto her and we'll get that child. What a mistake that was. We're still paying for that mistake. Aren't we? And here he is pouting and he's not doing well. 24 years has gone by and he's upset and he won't talk. You know, sometimes it's better for God to do the talking than you do the talking. Because a lot of times we say the wrong thing. Just ask Peter. Hmm. He fell upon his face and God talked with him and God reiterated to him all the wonderful covenant that he had made with him, that Abrahamic covenant, and that by his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed and the nations of the world would be blessed. And all of this is happening and in verse 17, after the Lord had 
again told him what I'm going to do. Listen to what he did. It says in verse 17 of chapter 17, Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. <laughs> sure, God. You ever laugh at God? Yeah, oh, that's never going to happen. Don't ever tell God something's never going to happen when he tells you it is. Amen. I have no doubt he's coming back. Amen. I believe what God's word says. Amen. You can take my word with a grain of salt, but you can't take, you can't take God's word. You can't take God's word and throw it away because it's going to happen. I believe God is real. And he loves us so much that he wants to give us the good and the right way. Well, it all worked out. Sarah, you know, Abraham taught Sarah to laugh. And she laughed at God. I'm too old to have a child. Not if God said you're going to have one. When can we get to the place in our lives where we believe him again? Amen. And believe that his word is for us. And that this word is applicable in 2024. It's as fresh as if it was written yesterday. And God makes no mistakes. So Abraham and Sarah had that child. Isaac, what a blessing. The second time we see people falling on their face is when, jo uh, when Jacob returned to Bethel, which was called the house of God there in Genesis 28. In fact, it was interesting because Jacob said, surely the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. You remember he had that dream and he saw a ladder come down from heaven and angels ascending and descending. Jesus, I believe at the top, talking to him. God still talks. And he has something to say every time he talks. Surely the Lord was in this place. Then later in chapter 31, God calls Jacob back to Bethel. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from thy face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said, his, uh, said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me. <laughs> the Bible says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. I don't care how you live, God's not going to forsake you. But why wouldn't you want to live so close to God that there's nothing that comes between you and God? Nothing. There's no way the devil can get in. That's how close we are to God. The Bible tells us in the book of Numbers, let's go to chapter 14 if you can keep up. Moses and Aaron are being murmured against because of Israel's unbelief. All the congregation in chapter 14, verse 1 of Numbers, they, they lifted up their voices and they cried and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? Wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. They forgot that they had to go across the Red Sea. You know, when, when, when you're not thinking right, you do some very dumb things. But so do I. Then Moses and Aaron, what did they do? It says there they fell on their what? They, their faces. When you have a crisis, I don't care whether it's in church, or whether it's at the house, I don't care. Whenever there's a crisis comes, whenever there's a problem that comes, and maybe we haven't figured it out yet, and we don't fully understand it, the best thing we can do is fall on our face. Amen. Lord, I didn't see this one coming. 
I don't know how I'm going to deal with this, but I know that I'm talking to the right person that can take care of everything. In fact, I'm getting, the more I talk to you, the less nervous I feel. And, and before you know it, I'm going to commit this whole thing to you and I'm not even going to worry about it. Amen. Have you ever done that? Amen. That's why we fall on our face. And Moses and Aaron fell on their face. And oh man, that story is amazing. The Lord, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Look at their verse, verse 4. They, and they said one to another, let us make a captain and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell upon their face before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. People that murmur and complain are prayerless and powerless people. Anybody can complain. Amen. The easiest thing to do is pitch a fit. Yeah. People don't treat me right. Doesn't sound like you're treating anybody right like that. Yeah. Amen. How come God blesses everybody else, but he doesn't bless me? Hmm. That sounds selfish. Yeah. And haven't we been blessed beyond measure? God's been so good to us, shame on us, forever doubting the Holy One. Moses and Aaron murmured, or Moses and Aaron were murmured against, but what they did was they fell on their face and said, God, what are we supposed to do? And God told them. Moses was God's ordained leadership, and he was opposed by Korah and 250 other men in chapter 16. Not only in Numbers chapter 14, but then chapter 16. They rose up against Moses and certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. At least they thought they were. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And they said, ye take too much upon uh, you, seeing all the congregation are holy. I don't think so. Every one of them. No. There's no time when everybody's holy. I don't think. I think everybody goes through a struggle sometimes. Some of you may have said, no, I don't really want to go tonight, but you got here. That's good. Get the message because it will help you whenever something comes in your way and you don't fully understand what's happening. What did they do? The Bible says in verse 4, and when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Moses was a meek and godly man. What a man to lead Israel. He had his moments just like you have yours. Correct? Amen. But he followed the Lord. In Exodus 32... Moses intercedes for God to spare Israel. Here's Israel making a mess, and he is viewing this and understands God sees it all. Moses was close, so close to God that he knew when God was about to speak. Listen to what he says. He said to the Lord, as Israel's going crazy in sin and debauchery and wickedness, he said, blot me. God was saying, I'm going to wipe this crowd out and we'll start over again. A holy God said that. I think if I was God, I'd have said the same thing, wouldn't you? Moses makes this statement to God. Blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. Oh, man. If you're going to take all them out, take me out too. And God didn't, didn't take them out. The power of one intercessor Amen. can make a huge difference. Amen. Oh, I love that when I know people are praying for us. Amen. It means a lot. Because if you're right with God and you're getting through, God hears your prayer. And then he looks upon Knickerbocker, Anne Marie and Dan and says, I'm going to take care of them. And has he done that? He has done that. Remember Balaam? 
Balaam was a man that God gave a chance to repent. In Numbers 22, verse 26, the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass, Balaam's ass or donkey, when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, the angel fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with, the, with his staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto him, What have I done unto thee, Balaam, that thou hast smitten these, these three times? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Sometimes people are dumber than an ass. And they don't even hear the voice of God. The ass heard it. And Balaam said to the ass, now he's yelling at the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. <laughs> what a dunce. And the ass said to Balaam, you can see him go like that with his head and look at him. Am not I thine ass? Upon which thou hast ridden, Ever since I was thine unto this day? Do you realize how long I've been hauling you around? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? I never would try to beat you up. He said, Nay. Then the Lord, watch there in verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. Who's got the sword? The angels got the sword. Not Balaam, thank the Lord. Amen. For the ass's sake, right? And the Bible says, and he bowed down his head, and he fell flat on his face. Have you ever been doing something, and you felt like, man, I shouldn't be doing this, and then all of a sudden God really gave you such... Um, such hatred for what you were doing that, that you stopped doing what you wanted to do. It might be a grudge. It might be bitterness. It could be anything that comes into your life. But all of a sudden it dawns on you, God is trying to straighten me out. And I was so backslidden, I never, I never, I never felt his presence until something unusual happens that wakes us up. That's how dull of hearing we are. One of the great sins found in the book of Hebrews was their dullness of hearing. Do you hear that still, small voice? Sometimes God only speaks to us in a still, small voice. And if we're not listening, we're going to miss it. To the very thought that God could speak to us is such an honor. Yeah, but when I'm doing something wrong, you, you, ought, you ought to really be thankful that he speaks to you. Then. What's really neat is when you're right with God and then he talks to you more. Because he's got things he wants you to do. I'm on the plane coming back to Texas a few days ago and I just started, I said, now Lord... There's some, I know there's things I need to do. And I was really challenged by a message my brother preached when we were together, all five of us were together and our wives and uh, he, he preached at a church we were in and man, did it convict me. I said, Lord, you've got to tell me what you want me to do. And then I just said, I'm going to write down things as you tell me. And they're all good things. Some things that I've neglected that I shouldn't have done or didn't get done. How many of you believe God's got some things for all of us to do? Amen. All you've got to do is just quit talking and just say, Lord, I'm here. Amen. Talk to me. He'll talk to you. He even made the ass talk. 
which is amazing to me. And yet Balaam, you know what he did? He loved the wages of unrighteousness, the Bible says in 2 Peter 2. In Jude 1, the Bible says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Balaam could be bought. He sold out. He sold out. Wow. How would you like to know the will of God about something? Let's go to Joshua chapter 5 real quick. Joshua needs the formula for victory uh, as they got into the the holy, what we would call the uh, uh, Canaan land, and uh, he needed a formula to figure out how to take care of Jericho. It's very interesting. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, Uh, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. He was out, I believe he was out seeking the Lord's direction on strategy. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. That sounds like somebody that wants to fight. And Joshua was not afraid to fight. He was a warrior. And Joshua went up to him. I can see him ride his horse right up to this person that's on his horse with a sword drawn. Art thou for us or for our adversary? What he was saying, if you're not for us, I'm going to kill you. That's the way a warrior thinks. Watch this now. And he said, and he said, this is the captain of the host of the Lord. I believe this is a, a Christophanes where Jesus came down in his pre-incarnate state. Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Wow. (laughs) When you know it's God talking, you better just drop right to your knees. We should never make God wait. Read Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be Let's go there. Since I'm talking about it, let's, let's go see it. I want you to, this verse has really, really helped me over the years. It's probably one of my favorite verses other than Jeremiah 33, 3. But go with me to Isaiah 30 and look with me at verse 18. Therefore will the Lord wait. Why does the Lord wait? That he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may that he may have mercy upon you, for the Lord is a God of judgment. Now look at the last phrase, blessed are all they that what? Wait for him. So you're either waiting on God or you're making God wait. How could a person make God wait? By doing what they know is wrong. Living a mediocre life. Being up and down, hot and cold, unfaithful. Your private life is the the very most important part of your life. If your private life's not right, your public life won't be either. So it all begins with God. Amen. Amen. And Joshua, of course, He fell upon his face, and what saith my servant and uh, the Lord unto thy his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose your shoe from off your foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. But if you take the time and go into the next chapter, you will find that God gave him all the strategy he needed to take care of Jericho. God always gives his best to those that leave the choice with him. Well, I think I'll do this. No, think again and say, Lord, what would you want me to do? Because his way is always better than yours. And I don't think any of us are as smart as God. The only people that are smarter than God are the people that don't obey him. I don't want to be one of those. Amen? 
Lest I be exalted above measure, Paul said. Remember, Paul was a pretty proud guy. But he said, a thorn came into my flesh to buffet me. And I asked the Lord to remove it, and he didn't. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. You want to be strong? You got to be weak. Amen. When you know you can't have victory, then you can. That's the way it works. Oh, I could go on and on. Joshua dealing with the defeat uh, at Ai. You remember that story? Oh, he was not pleased. He rent his clothes and fell on the earth with his face before the ark of the Lord. <laughs> you know what the Lord told him to do? Get up. <laughs> Wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and disassembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. And boy, they found out who it was. Achan was Achan. They stoned him. Him and his wife and his family and all that he had and then they burned him with fire. Do we know what it means, the judgment of God against our sin? How many of you believe God's long-suffering? He is, isn't he? Every one of us, if we got what we deserve, we'd be in hell. But thank God for Calvary, for his amazing grace. Well, I want us to bow in prayer right now. May we? I believe that the most important thing that we could ever do is humble ourselves before the Lord. I really believe that. We spend more time negotiating and planning and doing our own thing, and oftentimes we leave God out of it, and, and then we make mistakes, and then we get bitter, and it all just falls apart. It would never fall apart if you began your day with God. <coughs> And you prayed to him all day long. And you let him micromanage your life. How many of us, how many of us need to get closer and more intimate with God? Let's stand together. Amen. The altar's yours tonight. I think.